Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. If you do any form of gardening or even just like to look at gardens and flowers, our experts are with us this afternoon to share some timely tips and give us a heads up on any problems to watch out for or try to prevent. Back with us from the University of Vermont are Leonard Perry and Anne Hazelrig. It's great to see you both Good back here there. again. Thanks for <laughs> coming in during this blooming season. So Leonard, we'll start with um, with you and, and you know what's seasonal. Some, sometimes people are looking for plants that bloom at the end of the season. They are, Fran. Uh, that's a question I've gotten over the years is what blooms late in the season? You know, everything seems to bloom early. They go to the garden centers, get what's right. in bloom. Then I used to go late in the season uh -huh. that, before it gets what was bloom, bloom late. Like this native plant, um, brought a few pictures up today, the Hellenium, Hellenium or Hellenium, uh -huh. named after Helen of Troy. I don't know why, because it's a native to the North America, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, often called sneezeweed, not because it makes you sneeze. Uh, that's actually the ragweed, but actually this was used by early pe uh, colonists and, and Native Americans to uh, snuff, and that's what hmm. will make you sneeze. But this is the, na uh, the native species that you see, is yellow form, four to five feet high, loves damp or wettish soil, so that's a good plant for that. Um, and then over the years there have been many introductions, a lot of the ones mm. we have or 100 years old Beautiful. came out, uh, like this one, Moorheim Beauty actually came out in 1930 from the Netherlands, uh, kind of a reddish variation, again, kind of a, a taller one. It's interesting because I had a graduate student, uh, Annie White, who looked at uh, several different perennials, uh, native uh, species versus their cultivars. This is one she looked at, and the pollinators actually preferred the species. Uh, versus this, but this one had a lot of, uh, still had a lot of honeybees and bumblebees and mm. native bees, whereas there's more the, a few bumblebees, but more the, the honeybees on, on the species, but they really like that one more. So that's the Moorheim Beauty, again, a taller one. Now there's a whole, uh, a new series called the Mariachi series um, that's come out about six years ago, again, out of the Netherlands. They're only mm. about two feet high. They're compact. This is one called Fuego, and I have this in my garden. I've had it for about three years. This is a uh, performer. I mean, it, I've had all other perennials in these trial beds die with weed competition <laughs> and bad soil, whatever. This is looking gorgeous, just coming into bloom now. So and it's uh, such a happy looking is, flower. Yeah, That's just great. I like to call it you know, Helen's flower <laughs> instead <Right. laughs> of sneezeweed. <laughs> right. That's great. What a great tip. And uh, and what are you seeing at the diagnostic well, clinic? What's coming in these I days? I brought some show and tell. This uh. is from my own backyard. This is not my Christmas tree for next year, although it <laughs> kind of looks like some of our Christmas trees. But this is from a white pine. Uh, and what's happened is there's a pest called the white pine weevil, and I have a slide of it that's easier to mm -hmm. see, but what it happens is this little uh, beetle feeds and lays eggs in the top of white pines and causes the top two mm. years of the terminal to die back. So people are probably seeing this about now. It's pretty distinctive in the landscape. And so you won't see this little beetle laying the eggs, uh, but the next slide uh, shows what that beetle looks like. It's about a quarter of an inch long. It has a little snout and it feeds in earlier in the summer, lays eggs, and then these larvae, that's a picture of the mm. larvae on the right, feed in the um, tissue and then burrow their way down that so terminal. So the next picture shows all those larvae that are feeding in that mm. terminal. So it kills it. Yeah. So basically, if you see this in your um, backyard, you want to prune that out all the way down to the next whirl of branches because okay. a new whirl, a new branch will take over and become the new leader. So sometimes if you look at white pines in the landscape, they look kind of crooked. Right. And that's because, you know, periodically they're killed back and then a new leader has to take over. So sometimes that'll just happen naturally. It'll, it'll yes, it does. It does your, happen your tree naturally. It might be too high to really get up there exactly. and cut it out. Exactly. It'll happen naturally. Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I brought another I picture of another tree pest that we're seeing. I've gotten a Ooh. lot of calls about this. Hmm. This is a, called the red humped caterpillar, and it has a red hump. It's about hmm. an inch hmm. and a half long when it's full grown. And then its first abdominal segment, there's also a red hump. And they feed gregariously in a large group, and they can defoliate tree pretty quickly, especially wow. if it's young. I've gotten a call from a blueberry grower that had this. It's common on fruit plants, fruit trees, mm -hmm. and some forest plants. And the easiest thing for a home gardener to do is just hand pick them. Okay. You could spray something like Dipel is an organic 
mm -hmm. uh, targeted insecticide or spinosad, two okay. organic sprays. But hand picking, if you're if you can reach them, yeah. that's just fine. And then what do you what do you do with it? Well, hand that's pick them and then that's up to. I don't want to go into that. Okay, so that's up to the <laughs> the home gardener. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> so Leonard, you've experienced uh, some some bad bird seed, which is yeah, so interesting. Yeah, well, I feed what? right through the summer. You know, birds still busy uh -huh. now with the right. babies eating and uh, blackwell sunflower is what they prefer, and that's what I feed them, but I found, um, got a bag that was obviously bad um, and brought a picture of this, what they should look like, nice black uh. oily seed, and then next to it are the kind of off-color white seeds. It was kind of ah. musty, old smelling, and it kind of left a residue on your hand, and the whole bag was like this. So I went and to another place, got another bag, well, got another bag from this place, and it had some bad ones. Went to another store, and they had some too. I think the damp spring this year, and early in the season, and they weren't <laughs> stored properly. So I went to a third place, <laughs> and uh, I, I got some really good material. So end of the season, you know, it's old seed that was harvested last fall been stored through the months and dampness so just be aware don't feed that to the birds okay it, don't it, feed don't use they it. won't eat it or if they eat it they may get sick so okay. just don't use it take <laughs> it back and places have been very good about giving me a refund or a right. new bag so Let's take it back wow so um, it's it's also fair and and field days are everywhere which um, means these flower and vegetable competitions. So why don't you give us some, some tips to help okay, people yeah, I've been, get uh, that Okay, yeah, I've been working at the um, Champlain Fair as a judge for years and seen quite a few uh, things come through. And it's just, even if you don't enter anything, it's just great to go and, mm. and get ideas, see new flowers. Um, I brought some pictures to show um, there's a couple things. You can enter individual flowers, and you can see all the right. ribbons there. So you can get a little wow. bit of cash to spend at the fair just by entering <laughs> some of the flowers. Um, and, but then you can do arrangements, too, and I just some examples. This is just a classic arrangement here, all done in pink, another blue ribbon winner with um, zinnias and the plume celosia and some gumphrenas, just obamarant, some beautiful things. Foliages, another category, you can just do leaves of hostas and coleus and, and uh, ferns, many other things in there and arrange them artistically and really get some ideas. Miniatures are always popular. One of the things to keep in mind with miniatures is the height, you know, they have a restriction that. So read the guidelines, uh, have the right heights on that. Place settings for tables, that's uh, always a, a really beautiful thing where you nice. match right. all the different colors there and with the flowers. Uh, and this is one of my favorite art. And this person actually drew this folk art picture and then oh. made an arrangement to kind of uh, mimic that and match it. So just uh, gorgeous um, uh, things you can do. Just a few examples of the categories. And then, of course, uh, vegetables. We can't, uh, that's somebody else does those, but uh, uh, judges those, but we can't uh, forget that, you know, if you have some They're nice so vegetables. Beautiful. It's my yeah, favorite. Yeah, it's fun part. to just see those too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, tips are make sure you read the directions. Yeah, make sure you follow the directions. directions. A number of flowers in the and vase, heights of the arrangements, and so forth. Uh, cut them, the flowers when they're opening in the morning. That's best, not when they're fully open. And avoid mm. insect and disease damage. Those are just some of the key things. But the main thing is just read the book, follow the directions pretty closely, especially the vegetables have a lot of, you know, when to harvest, how to let them make them dry and so forth. So just make sure you follow those and you'll be ahead of the game. Right, that's great. <laughs> Cut in the morning, I, that, that's a good tip. Okay, I'll yeah. use that. And the flowers are fresh. <laughs> so Ann, ba back to you. Uh, you've got a few more um, yeah. problems to share with us. Right, a couple uh, diseases. One disease, downy mildew on basil has been showing up. Everybody likes Ooh. to grow basil and make pesto. Right. Well, there's a this relatively new fungal disease that came in on Hurricane Irene, I guess, back in mm. 2011. And what it looks like is if you look at the undersides of the leaves, it looks like it's dirty, basically. Right. But those are the spores of the fungus. And then if you look at the top part of the leaf, it looks like um, almost like it's a nutritional problem. So basically, once your basil becomes infected with this, there's no cure. You better just uh, get, get rid, rid of, of it because plant. you don't want those spores to go to your neighbor's garden. Oh, and okay. then I always recommend if you're, you are a big pesto maker, make it early in the season because this disease, it doesn't overwinter in Vermont, but it tends to show up mid-July. Late in the season. Yeah, I've seen so, it before, so that's right. good to know. And you don't want to use that stuff in your pesto. Or no, no, no. It'll probably give an off taste. Yeah. It won't hurt you, but it would not taste good. Okay, great. And the, you have some other Yeah, the other the problem we're issue. hearing about, everybody's harvesting blueberries, raspberries now, and there's a another new 
relatively new invasive pest called the spotted wing drosophila. And just as your berries are ripening, either raspberries or blueberries, this little fly with a saw-toothed ovipositor, she actually cuts into mm. the fruit, lays eggs in that fruit, and then little maggots or larvae develop yes. in that fruit, which is not very appetizing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it can really cause your fruit. Uh, I've heard from people, you know, oh, I had this great fruit crop, but then all of a sudden they all went soft. And that's ah. probably because the larvae are feeding in there and then fungi move in afterwards. Oh, yum. So the best uh, control, f <laughs> especially for home gardeners, is to purchase this row cover called Protec 80. Mm -hmm. and it's a very t small meshed row cover that can exclude that pest and you put it on just before the fruits ripen, you seal it at the base, you open it when you want to pick. Okay. So that's the best and if people want to know where to find that, they can call the Master Gardener Helpline. We'll have that information for them. Okay. The other thing is to pick fruit every day, chill it immediately ah. to slow down any development of the larvae and then um, okay. use it as, as needed. Okay, um, I think we're going to skip slime mold because we're almost out of time. <laughs> but <laughs> sure, we'll get rid of that too. <laughs> um, so, if gardeners or homeowners have questions about their slime mold or other things, yes. <laughs> they can call the Master Gardeners uh, Helpline. Yeah, uh, why don't you a give great us that? gardening resource six five six five four two one. Okay, or you can go to that website. And Leonard, your website also has up-to-date articles and information about flowers and gardens and your, your tours. Upcoming tours too, yeah. Perry's Perennial pages, perrysperennials.info. So uh, a lot of information there. Okay, okay, fantastic. Thank <laughs> you both for coming in. Thanks. I wish you good luck for the end of your, your <laughs> gardens and everybody else's. Uh, Leonard Perry and Anne Hazelrig from UVM Extension, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Thank you.